right. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Woo. Bring some revival in the church right now, man. Start shaking it up a little bit here. <laughs> Welcome to the house of the Lord, who's ready to praise Jesus this morning. He has done such great things in our lives. We come before him, ready to worship him, to glorify his holy name. Amen. He's worthy. He has lifted us from death. And now we are alive. Would you stand as we worship God? into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can The only The only one who can Oh, there's nothing Sing it out better than you nothing is better than you Lord oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you it's a morning you turn morning 
into dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can The only, only one who can Sing that one last time Oh, there's nothing Come on Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. Oh, there's nothing. Lord, there's nothing. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Amen. Man, take this time to greet one another if you feel safe. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Loving each other, one another, as Christ has called us to. Amen. This next song we're singing has been special to me because it talks about the miracles of God. Amen. Amen. The question is, do we believe in them? And Christ has showed us in his word that he is a God of miracles. He makes things happen. We just got to believe. I'm always intrigued by the fact that God said that as he went to Jerusalem, they said he didn't do many miracles there. And it was because of their faith. So in other words, if we activate our faith, then miracles happen. We just got to believe for it. Amen. This morning, I pray that you would believe for God to do a mighty work in your life. That he would do more than you could ever imagine. That you would believe for it. If you believe it, raise your hand. I believe God. That you will do a miracle in me, whether it's big, small, it doesn't matter. A miracle is a miracle. It's a work of God in our lives. From being able to eat to being healed from cancer, amen? It's a miracle of God. So we believe it this morning. We believe for your miracles, Lord, in our life. I pray if you are sick this morning that you would believe for a miracle. I pray that you've, if you are depressed or anxious this morning, that you would believe for a miracle right now. He is moving and he is doing what he does best. Amen. Let's believe for it. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tide will never change. They haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name, so much power in your name. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable, God we believe, God we believe for it. 
from the impossible we'll see a miracle god we believe god we believe for it oh we believe the lord we believe the lord yes we do we know that hope is never lost for there is still an empty grave God we believe no matter what that there is power in your name so much power in your name yeah, yeah. move the immovable break Unbreakable, God, we believe. God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe. God, we believe for it. We believe in Lord. You are the way, the truth, and life. Sing it out, come on. You are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. You are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. We believe that, come on. You are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. You are, you are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. Move the immovable, break the unbreakable. God, we believe, God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe, God, we believe for it. up your hands and believe for God's miracle yeah yeah we believe you Lord you are the way where there seems to be no way we trust in you, God, you have the final say. You are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. Oh, yeah, you are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you. God, you have the final say. We are, you are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. You are, you are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust, God, you have the final say. You are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. Let me hear you sing it out. You are the way. Amen. 
You are the way where there seems to be no way. We trust in you, God, you have the final say. Amen. We surrender to you, Lord, in your miracles and your blessing. We honor you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come and invade our space. We have no boundaries with you, Holy Spirit. We are free in your presence. Surrender to you, Jesus. Surrender to you, Lord. Surrender to you, surrender to you. Why don't you start praying to him? Lord, here we are. We come before you, Jesus. We come before you. Holy Spirit, come. Move within us. Touch us. Heal us. Save us. Breathe within, Lord, have your way, 
just breathe with him. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way in me. Like a mighty storm, stir within my Jesus, breathe within. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way in me. Yeah, yeah. Like a mighty storm, stir within my soul. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. I surrender I surrender I want to know you more I want to know you more I surrender I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I surrender. Sing that out to him. Come on. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know. in His presence this moment. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I surrender, surrender, Lord. I surrender. Good to see everyone this morning. After you had such a wonderful time yesterday. Amen. And as always, I want to uh, thank you all for inviting me and opening the pulpit here to me. Uh, my pastor and wife that I've known for how many years. I knew them when they here were black and blonde. <clears throat> Amen. And Pastor Peter. It is such a blessing. I truly thank God for you and thank God that you are a church that is serious about the things of God. And it is quite evident uh, at district conference where Pastor Peter and uh, Pastor Anna and Lori, we were there last week. One of the speakers, uh, Vice President of Church Ministries, really challenged us. He talked about sometimes we get so caught up in the administrative that we forget the apostolic. He called the church back to remember 
what our first call is. It is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I wanted to say a hearty amen. And I yelled out, tell it, brother. That was me who made all that noise. And you know why? Because uh, what has happened in the church today is that people have become, it's more about feel-good messages. And that's important, too, about I'm too blessed to be stressed. And so on, because if you listen to a lot of the messages, especially on YouTube and whatnot, I jump in there every now and then, very rarely do you hear the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And do you hear that if you have not taken Jesus Christ as Savior, you're not going to heaven. I want to talk this morning about it is redemption, not righteousness. It is redemption, not righteousness. It is a message meant to encourage all of us and to challenge some of us to make sure that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. As I always say, going to church does not make you a Christian because your parents, uh, you grew up in a Christian family. You may be Christian in name, but you, if you haven't taken Jesus Christ as Savior, you're not born again, a term that's been bandied around. You're not saved. Your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, I want to make sure that when you leave here this morning, you would know that you know that you know that no matter what Satan says, no matter what anybody says, no matter even when you're discouraged and you messed up, I want you to know that you are born again believer, that you have taken Jesus Christ as your Savior. And when you leave this place, the next step is heaven. Amen? That's my aim this morning. So with that, let us stand and read the scripture for the day which is Matthew 5, 17 to 20, and we will refer back to the scripture ever so often. Now, I may go a little tad long because we're going to be reading some scripture. So if you feel the need to leave, I will not be insulted. Amen? Um, because I know that people's time is under constraint, but this message is so important. I want it to tie in scripture with it. So let's read it all together, please. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Father God, I want to thank you for the prayer Pastor Peter prayed. I want to thank you, O oh God, and I ask, O oh God, that you would enable me to preach this message. As I often say, I'm not here to please anyone, not to offend anyone, but to preach this message as you give it to me. It is redemption, not righteousness, that matters to you. And I pray, O oh God, that this would encourage someone today that someone who's discouraged or doubting will walk out of here knowing good grief, it matters not what happened. I am born again. I'm Holy Ghost filled. And when I leave this place, I'm going to heaven to be with my Lord. And all God's sons and daughters said, amen. Please be seated. A few years ago, you may have heard in the news when pop star Prince had died, he did not leave a will. Therefore, there was no legal document or legal notice, law in place to say who should be the ones or the ones to inherit all the millions of dollars he had left behind. Hmm. There was no lawful document in place for anyone to fulfill. Because of that, there was fighting among the family members. People came up claiming to be Prince's child, 
Suddenly, siblings, he didn't know that he had finally realized they had a brother. Because there was no legal document, it was a free-for-all. There's another family I know of. They had their will already made up. The lawful document listed all heirs to the estate. The amount and item each was to inherit. The document was so set it could not be abolished or changed. This section of scripture for today was part of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached at the beginning of his ministry. In the messages, he was saying to the listening crowd what was to be the characteristics he expected to see in his disciples. You see that in verses 3 to 10. That the disciples should work to display those characteristics. You see that in verses 11 to 15. How they should look upon this new teaching in comparison to the religion, the, the teaching of the religious leaders of the day. You see that in chapter 5, verses um, chapter 5, 17 to 6, verse 18. The law, the five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, was what the Jews looked upon as the standard to guide their practice of the faith. The very way in which we look at the Bible in its entirety. Our section of scriptures falls where Jesus is teaching about how to view the law, which is their standard of practice, and how to view it in light of his new teaching. At this point in the scripture, Jesus is beginning to proclaim that he is the one who came to fulfill the law. From our text for today, there is something important and encouraging for us to learn or to be reminded of as believers in Jesus Christ. It is this. It is my redemption. It is not my righteousness that matters. I'm going to keep saying this. It is my redemption. It is not my righteousness that matters. So in looking at this from Matthew 55, 17 to 20, we're going to answer this question. What does this passage teach us about the importance of redemption over righteousness? First, we're going to look at righteousness is about the law. Then we will look at righteousness needs redemption. And lastly, redemption only leads to heaven. And uh, we, our first point, righteousness is about the law. And I'm going to read the scripture again. Do not think, Jesus said, I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus knew that the disciples, the crowd, the religious leaders worshipped the law. They, especially the religious leaders, followed it to the T. They followed it to the point that they thought doing exactly what the law said was more important than ministering or loving the people of God. Let me give you an example. Uh, several years ago in our church, there was a young man who was gone, a young lady who was gone down in her apartment. She opened her door, didn't know who was there, and shot her. So our church, we are part of a clergy council that works with the precinct in our community. And each church, in doing that, take the responsibility to, um, to offer the memorial service for these families who may not have the ability to pay for a funeral. Funeral's expensive, amen. So we had the funeral. A lot of our young friends came. They were so broken. They were so shattered because she was only about 15, 16, you know, and they have never experienced anything like this. 
and to come and see this coffin laid out in the front and they're seeing their friend laid out, you know, and all the clergy was there. They came to a church, a place that they felt they could come back to, to have their questions answered. So that Sunday evening, they came to the church to attend a Sunday evening service. They came dressed the only way they know how to dress. They didn't know church garb. They didn't know what to wear to church. These were free kids. So they came in their shorts, and they came in their T-strap, um, what they call it, T-strap uh, top, and showing a lot of flesh, but came to church broken, looking for answers. And guess what happened? One of our leaders had to preach that day and ridiculed. Oh, people have no respect. Need to come into the church. Flesh, flesh, flesh. Guess what happened? They never came back. So when we saw this happen, we ran out to try to embrace them to say, listen, come on back, you know. Don't worry about him. Come as you are. We don't mind. They said we will never come back. The letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. The letter of the law did not reach out lovingly to these people. And this is what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was about to say some things that might have given the idea that he was doing away with the law or that he had no, he, that it was no longer important. No. He, he was just adding and exemplifying it and expanding it in a way to say, for example, in 21 and 20, verses 21 to 32, he used the example where it says, it is said, do not murder. But I say, anyone who is angry with anyone has already committed murder. Do not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who looks upon another with lust have already committed adultery. Now, what I'm about to say may seem as though I'm contradicting myself, but listen, and it will all come together in the end. Remember, in this first point, I want to show that righteousness is about the law. Jesus wanted them to see the importance of the law. In verse 18, Jesus was showing that the law was there to stay, but he came to fulfill it. Anyone who truly understands the scriptures, know that the Old Testament is all about the Messiah who was to come, what he was to accomplish to save man from his sins and to bring man back into fellowship with God. If you read the scriptures with those things in mind, the scriptures will come alive to you. The law, the five books of the Bible, all speak of the coming Messiah. When Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, us listening knew exactly what he meant. The law was important because without it, there would have been nothing to fulfill. Can I say that again? The law was important for without it, there would have been nothing to fulfill. Because Prince did not leave a lawful will, there was no one who could fulfill the stipulations of the will. But anyone who would have and did leave a will, the ones named, the inheritance can fulfill the stipulations of the will. This is what Jesus was saying. What he was teaching was the fact that the law which spoke of him, he was there ratifying it. He was there fulfilling it. He was taking right to what it said of him. Jesus was saying, the law will not go away because it is a foundation declaring who I am, what I am to do, and what I am to accomplish. Now, I know it's a lot of teaching this morning, amen? It's stretching the brain this morning. But just hold on. We're going to land the plane eventually. So hold on. He also showed that the law is powerful. Verses 19 to 20. 
saying if you break one point of the law, you fail all parts of the law and become the least in the kingdom. If you teach anyone to obey the law, the law will be great in the kingdom. In a way, Jesus was mocking the teaching of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. To them, the law was about power and position. To them, the law was about power and position in the kingdom. And this they equated with righteousness before God, that those who obey and taught the law was more righteous and had a higher position in heaven. That was the power of the law for them. They had to come. They had come to venerate the law. They, that they believed the law had more power over man's righteousness than what God himself had to say. They based righteousness on man's works. This is what Jesus alluded to when he said later in Matthew 22, um, Matthew 23, Woe to you who tied the mint, the dill, the cumin, but neglect the more important matters of law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should practice the latter, Jesus said, without neglecting the former. What he was trying to teach them is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, they were so big on the law that every mint leaf they had in their house, ten for God, one for me, ten for God, one for God, ten for me, one for God. The mint leaf, the cumin, have you ever seen cumin seeds? How small those seeds are? Ten for me, one for God. They went through and they tied those things because doing the things were more important. But Jesus was saying what was more important was justice, mercy, and compassion. And sometimes in the church, we become like the Pharisees that we are so bent on the law, tithing this and doing that, that at times we forget the importance of mercy, compassion, and justice. Jesus said you should practice the latter without neglecting the former. In the book of James, he says, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumble at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. All of that to say Jesus wanted them to see that they gave power to the law that was not at all what God intended. The one who was saying this to them was the one who came to fulfill the law. Although the law was important and powerful, it was ineffective. So with all of its power, the law could not save anyone. It is the one who fulfilled the law can lead a person to heaven. Therefore, Jesus was saying to his listeners that if they depended upon righteousness through the law to make it into heaven, Oh, I could say to us, if you're depending upon the work you do in the church to say, that's all right, I'm going to make it into heaven. No. Therefore, Jesus was saying to his listeners that if they depended upon righteousness through the Lord to make it into heaven, then they would have to be more righteous than the Pharisees who tied even their mint leaves. Now, Jesus recognized the level of righteousness of the Pharisees. But he wanted everybody to know it was insufficient. He said one would need to be more righteous than the Pharisees to make it into heaven. And the listeners would know, good grief, we do not have the ability to live the lives of a Pharisee. We work, we got children, we are married. The Pharisees give their life to this lifestyle. So they got time to count out how many mint leaves they get and tithe it. If their righteousness is not enough, what about us? What does this passage teach us about the importance of redemption over righteousness? It is my redemption, not my righteousness. It shows that righteousness is about the law. Righteousness is about works, and it will not lead to heaven. That's why we have some people who
who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. And they're always on the street selling this and selling their books and selling that. And they think the more they sell, the more righteous they become. No. Not in the scheme of things where it comes to us as believers. Even if you're not able to walk and sell, and sell anything, work a dime. That, once you have taken Christ as Savior, that's what matters. Looking at all of this righteousness of the Pharisees and people concluding, well, I can't do that. Then how can anybody make it? This comes to a second point. Now, don't think the second and third point is as long as the first. I've been preaching for a long time that I know it's not as long. Righteousness needs redemption. The Greek word for righteousness is the word diakosone. It means to be deemed right by God. Deemed right by whom? God. Did I say man? Did I say your works? Righteousness is to be deemed right by God. The one who is the source, the author of righteousness is God himself. That is the meaning of the word. But but the Pharisees and the leaders had made righteousness a thing of man's actions. Let me tell you what God thinks of our kind of righteousness. Romans chapter 3. Can you put it up there for me, brothers? Romans chapter 3, verses 9 to 23. It's a long reading, but you've got to hear this. Because we need to understand what God thinks of our righteousness. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we, are, we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles are all under the power of sin. Now verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous. No, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Their throats are open grace. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth will be silenced and the whole world will be accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now apart from the law of right, now. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and prophet testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. That's why I'm here this morning to tell you it has nothing about your righteousness. It has all to do about your redemption. That Jesus Christ came and died for your sins. So no matter if you're the worst person that walks the earth and you come and you accept Christ as Savior, when God looks upon you, he's not looking at your work. He's looking at the redemptive work, the redemptive sacrificial work. That Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. Hallelujah this morning. Hallelujah. That's something to praise God for. What this is saying to us is what Jesus was saying to all who were listening. To him as he preached the Sermon on the Mount. Your righteousness is not enough. For Isaiah 6, 4, 6 says, All of us have become unclean and our righteousness are like filthy rags. So when you think your work is so wonderful, people may give you all the awards. They may give you all the accolades. 
Hallelujah. I saw this person there. Their wall was full of a wall. Guess what? That doesn't move God. You know what moved God? The fact that you are saved, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, that you are redeemed. Hallelujah. If our good deeds and our human-driven righteousness are so filthy before the Lord, then what can we do? Listen to what Christ was saying. Listen, what Christ was saying is that even the righteous Pharisees could not make it into heaven. Something more was needed. Imagine the shock. The crowd received the Pharisees whose chest was always pumped up in the air because they're the Pharisees. They're the righteous ones. They teach, so therefore they're above everybody else. And Jesus brought them right down to the level with everybody else. What they needed, Jesus was explaining, was that they needed the one who came to fulfill the law. Do you know what the fulfillment of the law was? It was the atonement for the sins of man. The day of atonement was the day all of Israel looked forward to. The day would be declared, where they would be declared clean and righteous in God's sight for just one year. The fulfillment was the one who came, who was to come to redeem man from sins once and for all. That is all Jesus. When you come to Christ, he's not covering you for your one year. You are covered for eternity from the day you accept Christ to the day you leave this place. You are covered in Christ. You're redeemed in Christ. You're forgiven. That is the reason not even the high level of righteousness of the Pharisees made them good enough for heaven. Even their righteousness needed. To be redeemed. Righteousness is nothing without the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. The one who came to fulfill the law. What does this passage teach us about the importance of redemption over righteousness? It is my righteousness. It is my redemption, not my righteousness. That was our first point. It shows that righteousness is about the law. Righteousness is about works. And it will not lead to heaven. Our second point was righteousness re needs redemption. Righteousness is nothing without the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. And this brings us to our third and final point. Redemption only leads to heaven. Redemption only re leads to heaven. Let me read the verse, verse 20. Could you put that verse up for me, brothers? The main verse. It says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will, of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, you know you're in trouble when Jesus says, surely, surely, as uh, King James would say, or oh, certainly. Jesus is making it point blank clear. Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law, you think your righteousness is, and your works is going to get you into heaven? How did he say it? No, you're not. He said, certainly no. The lesson here is for all of us is this. It is not our good works that makes a way for us into heaven. It is the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And when you accept that work, that is how you come to be able to go to heaven. And I'll talk about it more as, uh, in the conclusion. Sometimes if you remember people like Billy Graham and a T.D. Jakes or some people who you see busy doing the work of the Lord and we see their fruit and we think, my goodness, they're doing such a powerful work for the Lord. He is a real man, a real woman of God. They're doing the work. But in God's eyes, what is important is this. Did you accept the one who came to fulfill the law? The one who atoned for your sins. That is the Savior, Jesus Christ. Could you put up uh, Matthew 7, 21 to 23 for me? And when I talk about atonement, 
It means when you take Jesus Christ as Savior, he took the place to die in your stead so that when you take Christ as your Savior, all your sins, past, present, future, erased, gone, the condemnation of sin, gone. You're covered under the blood of Jesus Christ for eternity. Listen to what God said, Christ said in that same teaching on the mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? That means preach and teach. And in your name, drive out demons, deliverance ministry. In your name, perform miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. There was a young lady I was ministering to. Her mom brought her to me because she came and she had an encounter with Christ somehow. And she was just weeping, weeping, weeping. And her mother couldn't understand, why is my child who was once so full of life and whatnot, weeping, weeping, weeping. So when the young lady came, I came to understand she had, through another faith, I'm not going to say what it is, she had some sort of encounter. And so she was praying to God one day in all that was moving in her. And she came to me and she said, you need to help me. Because while I was praying, God said to her, you know me, but I don't know you. So I explained to her that what started there was not of Christ. And so the Lord led her to me, was able to lead her to Jesus Christ. Please, my brothers, if you are not sure that you are afraid to accept Christ as your Savior, don't wait. Then he says, depart from me. I never knew you. The thief on the cross. Let me go back, sorry. It was, the, it, it was what the Pharisees were doing that the Lord said, it is not the will of the Father. It is not your service that brought you to salvation. It is your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ to acknowledge him as Savior and to take him as your Lord. To prove this to you, put up the next one for me, brothers. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. Because too much, and I'm not saying that works isn't important. The church has made salvation too much about the work. We got to preach and we got to help people to understand. You've got to come to Jesus Christ. You have to take him as your Lord and Savior. I don't care what work you're doing. Unless that has happened, you're not in. Let me prove this to you. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. These were the two thieves who was crucified alongside Christ. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then Jesus said, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Please pay attention to Jesus' response. Jesus answered, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Did he say tomorrow? Did he say next week? He said today. Now let me ask you some question. The thief on the cross, he went to heaven by simply taking Christ as his savior, acknowledging who Jesus was. What sermon did he preach? What Bible study did he lead? Where did he teach Sunday school? Who did he lead to Christ? When did he speak in tongues? When did and was he baptized? How much tithes did he give? Who did he lead to Christ? What did he do? 
he took Christ as Savior, and he went to heaven within a few hours of making that confession. My brothers and my sisters, I want you to understand, it is about his redemption, not your righteousness. Allow me to say this. Although redemption is important, and it is more important as a follower of Jesus Christ, we do have to do the work of, of the kingdom here on earth. But we must keep in mind that's all it is. It does not save you. When you love God, and you have a passion for God, and you love him with all your heart, and you love him with all your might, and you love him with all your strength, that is what drives you to do. But you cannot have that love and passion for God if you have never taken God, Christ, as Savior. Yes, you're in the church. Yes, you're doing the work. But that's all it is. You're doing the work. But it will not save you. Yes, you may mess up. But in Christ, you're okay. Yes, you may fail. But in Christ, you're okay. Yes, you may not please everybody, but in Christ, you're okay. Yeah, you may not be the best testimony in your neighborhood, but in Christ, you're okay. Yes, you may do what people think you ought not to do, but in Christ, you're okay. You know why? Because you're covered under the blood, the might and power of Jesus Christ, and you have redemption. Let me tell you how this ends, and this is my conclusion. Could you show Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15? I am not up here to tell you that the Christian life is easy. And if anybody tell you that, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen? The Christian life is not easy. It is one of the most difficult choices you can make today because everybody will try to ridicule you, humiliate you, make you feel stupid, the media does a good job of it. A pastor make one mistake and they blow it up all over. But the crooks in Washington can do whatever they do. Do not let nobody rob you of your strength and confidence in God. Are we perfect? No. Will we ever be perfect? No. Not until you die. That's when we go home to be with Jesus. And we are glorified in the spirit, hallelujah. And once we were with Jesus, no demon in hell can ever trouble us again because we are covered in his righteousness. But let me read this to you. Let me tell you how it ends for us. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the book were open. There are two set of books there. Pay attention. If you have it, underline it in your Bible. Highlight it on your device because this is very important. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the, the throne. And the books were open. Another book, plural, was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Let me explain that. The books have a record of all your thoughts, all your words, all your actions. So when crooks, thieves, robbers, people doing all their backdoor deals and their little secret whatnot, they think God don't know. God knows. It's recorded. And when you get to heaven, he's going to put in your tape and you would see everything flash before you. So when people think they're doing stuff in secret, and they're getting away with it, and God don't know there's coming a day where they're going to have to stand before the Lord. But there's another book. The, uh, the book, that's the book for those of us who didn't live for righteousness, but were redeemed. Your name is written down in that book. Hallelujah, Jesus. But let me not get too happy yet. Hallelujah. Oh, God, help me. This is exciting stuff. Because you see, it comes a point where Satan can't do nothing. Hallelujah, God. We thank you. We thank you, Jesus. Where am I, God? I lose my place. Okay. 
The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. So that means everybody, believer, sinner, saint, Gentile, Jew, male, female, boy, girl, all of us are going to be judged in front of the throne. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. That means where you're sent to hell. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Let me tell you what happened. We all standing before God. You know, on the last day, the dead in Christ, the, everybody stands the dead without Christ. Those who are alive, everybody just standing, and the throne is there. The books you are judged, you did this. Back there, you had this deal with this one back there. Kill this person back there, and do you think nobody knew it? You think you got away with it? I knew it. You're, and the devil is standing right there. Yeah, 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 he did it, he did it. He did it, she did it. They're going to come with me. They're going to come with me to hell. And then God will look over in the book to see if your name is written in the book. Your name not written, you're gone with Satan. He look in the book and he says, yeah, she was a hot mess, that Donna. But look, her name is in the book. Satan, you're going to leave empty-handed. That's the difference. That's the difference. When you take Christ as Savior, and your name is in that book of life, in Ephesians it says he puts a seal of the Holy Spirit upon you, that you're recognized in the spiritual realm. Why do you think you got problems on the job? Why you think you can't get along with certain people? It's because they see the spirit of God in you and they get irritated. But I'm here to encourage you this morning. No matter what you have gone through, no matter how you have messed up, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So when you stand before the throne of God, you're not going with Satan. Guess what? Get on in to the pearly gates. Get on in to heaven. Get on in and join with the worship. Get on in and join with the elders. Get on in and celebrate. Hallelujah. So if you're discouraged this morning and walking in your faith with Jesus Christ, if you have been challenged, I want you to remember this. You remind everybody, I may not be perfect, but my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah this morning. You're discouraged this morning. Hallelujah this morning. You're ready to give up. Hallelujah. Your name is written. And there is a thing that Satan can do about it. It's over. It's done. One last thing and I'm closing. Revelation 21. 1 to 6. This is how it really ends for us. Then I saw what? A new heaven. And a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down. Hallelujah. Out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride. Beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying. Look. God is dwelling, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things have passed away. Hallelujah. He who was seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirst I will give water. Without cause from the spring of water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. I will be their God. And they will be my children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do not get discouraged in doing the will of God. Do 
not be discouraged in living for Christ. It is getting harder and harder as we go on. Amen? You are not here. What's wrong with your heart? Because when you're discouraged on your worst day, remember my name. Your name, if you have taken Christ, is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to do a different kind of um, altar call. If you have taken Jesus Christ as your Savior already, and you know your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, stand up and claim it. That is who you are. And don't you dare ever allow anybody to tell you that you're not a born-again Christian. That when you leave this place, that you're going to heaven. Are you perfect? No. You will never be perfect. Even till the day you die, you won't be perfect. But guess what? I may not be perfect, but I'm covered in the blood. I'm redeemed by Jesus. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And when Satan comes and tries to tell you about your past, you remind him of his burn, baby, burn. Amen? That's, that's Pastor Donna kind of preaching. So I want to ask now, any who is unsure of their walk with Christ, if that is you, Please see Pastor Peter at the end. We got to make it sure. Because too many people running around in the church and they're not sure. It is not your, it's not your righteousness. It's not all the nice work you do and all the money you give. It is the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters today. Father, we lift our hands, lift your hands, and we claim our identity. I am born again. Come on, say it. I'm born again. Jesus died for my sins. I am redeemed. I'm covered by his blood. I am filled by his spirit. I'm marked by his seal. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. God bless you this morning. Same spirit, we want to thank you, God in our lives the blessings that you've poured out for the life that you've given us and the hope that we have in salvation through you we are confident and firm in our faith and our belief in our Lord we are grateful God that you've chosen us to follow you to praise you and to worship you to you. There are some of you who need to rededicate your life to the Lord. The Lord just put that in. Yes, you are born again. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Identified by Christ, but you haven't been living it. God sees and he knows it. It's not that he doesn't love you or condemn you. He's saying it's time to get back in relationship where you once were with the man. So as Brother Carlos
want to renew my covenant with you. I want to renew my relationship with you. Father God, I can't do it on my own. I need your Holy Spirit to help me as well. But today, I am making a new covenant with you to be, to give you all of me. I dedicate myself to Jesus Christ to be his father and to be the obedient one, that obedient sheep that will follow him. Too long I've been the sheep that he's been running after and calling back. But I'm turning around and I'm going to be that sheep that sticks close to your head to receive all the love that I need, that I'm yearning for, looking for in all the wrong place. But oh Jesus, I come. Praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. Hallelujah And all my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response I've got just one move With my arms stretched wide And I will worship you So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song 
Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, and come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Sing, so I throw up. So I throw up my hands. And praise you again and again. So all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah, and I know it's not much, nothing fit for a king, except for a heart singing. Hallelujah,
my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those stones Get up and praise the Lord Oh, and come on my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those thrones Get up and praise the Lord So I, so I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much Nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah So I throw up my hands Praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Except for hearts singing, how. 